All right, shut up. <laughs> All right. Uh, so how did the uh, stuff for today go? So it was good? Yeah, good. well, I mean, besides the missing semicolon that we spent an hour looking for, yeah. Yeah. Oh, belt checks. Jack? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are killing me. Mr. Gonzalez is still debating. I was about to say the verdict's still out. Oh, it's in here. I got it. <laughs> it's in here. I got it. You should be sleeping in that. I haven't taken this off since I put it on. Have you? No. Yeah. That's part of that gets washed day. every day with a shower. Yeah, Everything's yeah. good. Well, that's because of the shower. But huh? You wash your hands and stuff. I'm sure it gets washed. See, this band is black, so that really. No, that is, that's, doesn't count. I have that on it, too. No, it's unfortunate that you think that counts. It's, it does not. <laughs> you just remember that Mr. Gonzalez can get into your home. <laughs> he can haunt your souls. <laughs> All right. Um, so today we're going to start talking about getting some output out to the screen, and we're going to specifically talk a little bit about drivers. Um, I remember last time, so we're kind of making our transition. We're seeing that, uh, well, our, our first cl first class, we really looked at assembly stuff, kind of getting the ball rolling, and we convinced ourselves that, hey, assembly language is all nice and all, and you know, if we have to dive down to that level, great, but if we can operate at the C level most of the time, we'd be happier, right? Um, last time we operated at the C level most of the time. Today, we're gonna also be operating at the C level most of the time, but we're gonna see some situations where we can't uh, and have to do some embedded assembly code inside of our C programs to accomplish a couple of things. And again, we're looking at, um, well, in this case, we're, we're kind of, our focus today is gonna be on two things. It's gonna be on um, serial input output and then on uh, uh, drivers. So what is it, when you, when you hear, uh, and most of you had my programming classes, like all of you took, went through my programming classes, you notice that I usually call like the, the program that has main in it, I usually call it driver. Mm -hmm. Why is that? When you think about hardware drivers, you know, you, you get a new graphics card, you get a driver. What is a driver? Go ahead. Isn't it the like main file that kind of runs everything? Okay, so I kind of advertise it as, I always put my main method inside of that file called driver because I say all programs begin and end with main, right? And the driver is what drives a piece of hardware. We can think of a driver as driving our operating system, but usually we're really thinking you're gonna have a driver for like a mouse. You're gonna have a driver for a graphics card. You have a driver for a keyboard. These are the things that, um, that drive the IO operations and other, well, I guess every operation is IO. The IO operations of that device, um, because sometimes devices, you know, like think about gaming mice. You might have a mouse and you have a generic mouse that has two buttons, right? And then you have a gaming mouse that has like 50 programmable buttons, right? For people who have fingers that can bend in directions they're not supposed to bend. Some of those buttons are not in natural places, right? Um, but then you need a, you, you know, you could plug it in and the thing will work as a mouse with two buttons, but you won't get those extra features until you install the specialized driver for that 5,000 button mouse, right? Dude. Um, no. <laughs> I don't feel like it. <laughs> I'm not answering the question anymore. All right. So um, we can all agree that one of the things our operating system should be able to do is put stuff on the screen. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's we've been kind of impressed at this point, maybe, or hopefully you've been a little impressed that you know we've been able to somehow load something into a very specific register on our emulated CPU. And that's kind of proof of concept, right? But when you're using an operating system, we kind of expect crap to show up on the screen where we don't have to like use special tools to, you know, peel back the uh, bone structure of our of our computers just to see that a certain value got placed somewhere. So we want to start thinking about um, I/O and our operating system. So I, I preloaded our slides with just a couple of things that I want to talk about first, just to kind of prepare us for this. Um, a couple of things initially uh, that we're going to be looking at today are things called bitwise operations and bit shifts. Um, 
So, for instance, we have this operator here, the uh, greater than, greater than, and also a less than, less than. And these are for right and left shifts. Um, have any of you ever done bitwise shifting before? Yeah, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> Not since my disco years. <laughs> well, is, am, I, am I off the, off the internet? Ninjaed? Ninjaed. Oh, so I can't even create a slide? <laughs> Welcome right. to the internet age, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Can I edit this slide? All right, here, we'll, 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 to, uh, we'll copy it over. <laughs> All right, shut up! At what point did like people start getting concerned? <laughs> like at about the 13 minute mark, like, is he okay? <laughs> well, he's not okay, but. If he doesn't speak for 15 minutes, you're allowed to All right, so let's say we want to, we have something like that. All right, and we're just, so this is saying, uh, do a bitwise shift on three by two bits. Um, so this presumes almost all these things. Whenever you hear the word bitwise, ninja. Oh, I can create a new slide out here. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Ha ha. So whenever we hear, whenever we see the uh, the phrase, the word bitwise, you know, we are working in binary on a bit by bit basis. All right, so three bitwise shift two. Um, we're going to first give ourselves the uh, binary version of three. I'm going to go ahead and pad this out to eight bits. Usually we're dealing with um, bit spaces of eight bits or 16 bits or 32 bits. And whenever I say bit space, that's what I'm kind of talking about. You know, we uh, are uh, in our computers, we store bits inside of containers. And those containers come in some fixed sizes, like an 8 bit container or a 16 bit container or a 32 bit container. So if I stick the number three into an 8 bit container, <laughs> all right, we're just going to do it on this one for a little bit because it seems to be inconsistent. So if I have the number three in an 8 bit container, I'm going to have six leading zeros, right? So that is the number three represented as eight bits. Everybody's cool with that? All right, so if I'm going to do a left shift of two, that's going to give me that. So I've shifted all my bits left by two, moving this one, one, two, moving this one, one, two, moving every individual bit over two, losing these guys, and then giving myself two fresh bits here on the side. Just as an example. Okay, we're gonna see some examples when we might use it uh, today. Go ahead. Um, so typically with a bit shift, you're going to fill that empty space with a zero. Is there a single operation? It's the bitwise and. We're gonna see it today. Okay. Yeah, so what he's, he's kind of talking about is where we're going with this is you get your value positioned where you want it. Then you can do a bitwise and with it to guarantee you've zeroed out the space you've emptied out or something oh, like that. Oh, I was that. actually asking if there was a way to kind of instead of pushing it with zero, push it with ones. Uh, not with a bitwise shift, no. Okay. Um, you can force ones with a bitwise or. Right. Um, with ones. <laughs> Anything or one would be a one, right? Um, so, yeah, don't worry about that for right now. I think he's a little bit ahead, but yeah. All right, so everybody gets the what this operation is. Not necessarily why we would do it, just you get what it is. We shift everything over by a couple bits in this example. All right, for whatever reason, we might want to do that. Similarly, we have a right shift. So if I have a you know, five right shifted three, 
That's going to be 101. And I'm going to right shift that 3, which is going to give me a bunch of zeros. I've pushed my 101 off. Everything's moved over, which probably be kind of a waste, but that's what's happened there. Make sense? All right. All right, so then we have bitwise operations. So uh, let's test you on this first. Um, if I do What does that mean to you? Five to the second power. So you're expecting a 25 out of that? Yeah. All right, so just real quick, I'll just go out to um, Python. So here's the Python interpreter thing here, and we'll do uh, five to the second power, and of course we get a seven. Question is, is why? Yeah, so this is the bitwise exclusive OR. So most of our modern programming languages do not treat the caret as a power. So in Java, we would say like math.pal, or in Python, you would say uh, 5 star star 2. That gives you your 25. All right, so how does this actually work? How did we actually get to our 7? So this guy is going to give us a 7, not a 25, because this guy is a bitwise XOR. So XOR says one or the other, but not both, as opposed to an OR, which says at least one, as opposed to an AND, which says both. All right, so the number five is one, zero, one. The number two in three bits is going to be zero, one, zero. And then we do an exclusive OR among those. So one exclusive OR zero is one. Zero exclusive OR one is one. One exclusive or zero is one. Exclusive or says it's one if exactly one of the bits between the two is a one. All right, and this is the number seven. Make sense? That's how that is working. That's a bitwise or. When we say bitwise, we're doing a, well, bitwise XOR in this case. We're doing an XOR operation on each individual bit of those two values. Uh, five, where's my, so five bitwise or two values. So this is one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and it's a bitwise or, um, actually this is kind of a bad example because it'll give us the exact same, the exact same uh, output. So let's just do a, a three. Uh, actually let's do a, Whatever, we're just gonna do it. All right, so, <laughs> ORs are rough because you get a lot of ones out of ORs. Um, let's see, we can do a five bitwise four. So that'd be a one, zero, zero, right? So five bitwise OR four, this would be a one or a one is a one, zero or a zero is a zero, one or a zero is a one. So this is gonna give us a five. So five bitwise four is a five. Make sense? Not to be confused with our, in Java, double vertical bar, which is the Boolean logical operator for or. Finally, we have our bitwise and. Nope. Listen. So then, nope. Uh, so then, like the OR and then the XOR, like what is the main difference between them? Because like one, one or zero is equal one. It's the same thing with the no. Uh, well, one or one is one. Okay. One XOR one is zero. Oh. XOR is exclusive OR. It says one or the other, but not both. So. Um, Correct. 
So or says one or the other or both. XOR is one or the other but not both. They can't both be ones. So another way of putting this is exactly one true. That's what XOR says. I'm looking for exactly one one. And AND is looking for exactly zero zeros, zero falses. Everything is true. All right, so that's the difference between an OR and an XOR. So five of good. So the caret was the XOR, correct? Correct. Okay. All C based languages, all C based languages are uh, caret is an XOR. And by all, uh, all of them I can think of. Every now and then you might run into a language where an XOR is actually defined with the, the letters XOR. Um, but as much as I can remember, every XOR in a C-like language is the caret. It's a basic Google search anyways. Right, but what's important about this is, and especially for beginning programmers, um, is you might type in this as a beginning programmer and think you're getting five to the second power. Now, instead of getting an error though, you're getting a number, just the wrong number. And unless you know what bitwise operations are, you might not have any idea why that's coming out to a seven. You might say, oh, is that like a new symbol for plus? But then you say, oh, well, I could do a six bitwise two, but that doesn't give me an eight. Um, you know, now you're even more confused, right? So, you get what I'm saying? Uh, so bitwise operations can sometimes be frustrating because they are giving you numeric results, not Boolean results. And if you're expecting a number and you get a number, but it's the wrong number, you might not know you had an error. And all of a sudden you have a program with a bug that's very hard to find. All right, so bitwise and, same thing. So we have one, zero, one. We have one, zero, zero. And this is gonna be one, zero, zero. So that is a four. Make sense? One and one is one, zero and zero is zero. Zero and well, one and zero is zero, so one zero zero is four. All right, questions. Oh, why do I keep doing that? Questions about uh, bitwise operations, the shifts and the bitwise Boolean operations. We're cool with that. All right, let me see if I can get these guys over here. Oh, we're still offline? Good. Uh, okay. So in here, we're going to be talking about how do we interact, start interacting with our hardware. Initially, the hardware that we might want to first interact with is the screen. Getting stuff out on our screen. All right. Uh, there's two ways we can accomplish this in let's call traditional computing systems. Uh, one is through memory mapped I.O. And this is a... I don't know, somewhat complex way of saying, we're going to hide a value somewhere in a very, very, very specific place in memory that I happen to know that somebody else is gonna go and check. Okay, that's memory mapped IO. So I happen to know that the computer is gonna look in this particular bucket at some point in time to get a value. So I'm gonna put my value there so that when it goes and looks for it, it finds it. IO, uh, reading something in works that way where you know you read a value in it gets stored in a very specific register knowing full well that on the next cpu cycle it will check that register to see if something was read in previously all right so you're putting something in a very special place all right um yeah so we're going to see how we can do this on a uh, in the io in a second i just want to introduce this stuff at the high level and then we'll go and look at the book the other thing we can use is io ports um, these are traditionally just called serial ports, but there's other kinds of I.O. ports that we can use, but we're going to be talking about kind of the old school uh, serial port. If you've, um, most computers don't have it today, we might be able to find an older computer over there that might, but it's the thing that looks like, um, kind of like a VGA port, but it has the, but it had, no, no, that's a parallel port. 
uh, but it has the, uh, um, uh, so it would be male. A male version of a VGA uh, port with the pins coming out. Huh? Yeah, they might. Okay, but it's a nine pin output for serial communication. Because somewhere on the motherboard, there's going to be a serial port. It just might not necessarily in modern computers be um, uh, exposed to us directly. Uh, because now we usually use USB for any sort of serial devices. Uh, even though technically USB is built on top of a parallel, parallel technology. It's kind of funny how that's called universal serial bus. But it's actually built on top of a parallel technology. That's why it's bursty in speed. Um, but a long time ago when we had like dial-up modems and stuff like that, you would plug them into your computer via the serial port. All right, but... For our intents and purposes, two different ways we can talk to our hardware, either by uh, having our, you know, hiding values throughout memory in our computer and letting our computer, you know, they, they said, okay, well, we're going to make something come out here as long as you put a value there. And we're just going to keep checking it. Because that's how we've, you know, decided and some crazy guy hopped up on something, decided that's that's the place in memory where we're going to put it just because. Um, <laughs> so that there's some old school kind of, we're kind of seeing how the early computing and early operating systems were put together and that stuff still exists today um, to a certain extent. If it's not broke, why fix it, right? Um, similarly, we could have our external devices that we might want to talk to, not just our monitor, but... You know, other external devices, a mouse, some LED sign, you know, whatever it is, uh, we might want to talk to that as well. A printer um, that we might use IO ports to do the, dis the talking with that. Um, okay, so uh, so we use assembly code instructions out and in to do this communication. Today we're going to be focused on how do you write stuff out to the monitor. Well, we're going to have to use the out function to write something over some sort of port that will ultimately go out to the monitor. We're going to be using something in here called the frame buffer. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second. All right, so the out function, so these are just two functions that exist. The out function takes two parameters. The address of the I.O. port, so all these ports that are on our computer, they have hard-coded addresses associated with them. All right, so there's going to be some place in memory that's physically hooked up to that port so that when we write something to that place in memory, it follows that wire to the port, so to speak. All right, so that'll, that, it's going to be meaningful to us where those are, but we can just think of that's the unique identifier for a particular serial port. So it's going to take the address of the port we want to write out to and then the data we're going to write out. Makes pretty good sense. Where am I writing it? What am I writing? In. This guy takes a single parameter, that is the address of the IO, IO port, and it's going to return the value we're reading in from that IO port. The serial port is what we're really talking about when we say IO port right now. Okay, so we have something called the frame buffer. So think of the frame buffer like a two-dimensional array. It's a two-dimensional array representation of your screen. All right, so this is a much... Uh, older school situation where we weren't thinking about uh, super high resolution 4K displays and things like that. So we have 80 columns across, 24 uh, rows deep. That is the grid that is our monitor, our equivalent of kind of a light bright or something like that. All right. So we're thinking about this guy being um, our representation of our screen in our very simple old school operating system. All right. So this is a way of displaying a uh, buffer of memory on the screen. So the idea is we fill this buffer up and then our screen shows the current state of the buffer with all the right things turned on and off and things like that. Yeah. Um, this is like 80 character columns, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't know what the character is supposed to look like, like the individual because it, it, it uses the character set. Yeah, we, we don't turn on a pixel. We turn on a byte, which maps to an ASCII character. Okay, so the monitor or something has a built-in character set. Somewhere in there, yeah. There's, there's, somebody's doing the mapping for us. Uh, probably C, actually, in our case today. Um, okay, so we kind of get what frame buffer is. 
two-dimensional array, make it look the way you want your monitor to look, and we'll talk about what that means, because you can say, what do I want to write there, and also what color do I want it to be? Foreground and background. So my font color and the background. If I want it to still be a black color, or if I want, it, if it's a multicolor monitor, you can have different color backgrounds, that kind of stuff. Super high tech, we're gonna be making the next greatest video game this way, using frame buffers. With a very fixed, fixed resolution. <laughs> this is extremely fixed resolution. Um, all right. All right, so now we're going to dive into the book and kind of see uh, where this is going. I'm going to walk us through uh, what some of the code is, uh, is doing. Um, we'll probably be able to get it all done today, but you're doing it for next class regardless. So that becomes your problem, not a me problem. But we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think we've given you all the prerequisite information that you'll need uh, to go through this. So I'm actually going to flip over here to Ubuntu. Um, oh, what's the name of my Oh, the internet's down. Good. Oh, yeah, well, at least I have the page loaded here. <laughs> All right, so um, is everybody else down on the internet too? Uh, I'm good. You're working? You're on Falconet? Yep. Uh, Rainfall works too. On this side too. Yeah, that's right. I'm talking to Rest Hall. Forecast. I think it's working for us. I, I got kicked off. Alright, well, let's turn off and then turn back on. Okay, I think we're, uh, I think we're back in business now. All right, we already talked about that stuff. All right, so when we write text to the console via the frame buffer, it's done using memory mapped I.O. So we're writing stuff to a very specific place in memory that is the representation of the frame buffer so that it goes and grabs it and makes it true. So the starting address of memory mapped IO for the frame buffer is this guy right here, B8000, whatever that. So this uh, memory is divided into 16 bit cells, two byte cells. Make sense? So we have 16 bits to work with for each of these and they're gonna break it down to what this is, and this gets to your question before. What, how does it know, you asked it, right? Who asked the yeah, pixel question? You asked the pixel question. All right, so that's the what, that's the ASCII value we're going to, so that's the high eight bits. This is our foreground color is a four bit value. This is our background color is a four bit value. Four plus four plus eight is 16. So we're using 16, a, a bit space of 16 to represent three values. The 8-bit ASCII value, the 4-bit foreground color, so this is 4-bit color, super awesome, crazy frame buffer video monitor thingy. Are we using that um, CGA at this point? Or are we less than CGA? Uh, well, I don't know. VGA was 16-bit color. Um, less than CGA would have been monochrome. So I. I, I don't remember if CGA is 4-bit or 8-bit. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Let's assume it's 4-bit. Otherwise, this is just a made-up thing. Or just used half the bit space. Uh, it was 4-bit color. All right, so this is a 4-bit value representing uh, what does 4 bits give us? What's the biggest 4-bit value we can have? How many unique colors can we fit in 4 bits? 16, 16 colors. 1111 one, one, one is 15, 0000, zero, zero, zero is 0, 0 to 15 is 16 unique colors. So we can represent 16 unique colors in four bits. This is the same thing as our trick of going from hexadecimal to binary. You can do it in four bit nibbles. So four bits gives you a representation of some hexadecimal value. So this is going to be a some color for the foreground, 
some color for the background. All right, so we're using 16 bits of space to hide those things in there. Make sense? All right, so when we write something to our frame buffer, now notice it says the starting address of our frame buffer is right here. So our frame, bu frame buffer has a base address of V8000. After that, we have to deal with offsets of it to walk through memory to the correct column and the correct row. Make sense? All right. So we can see here they've broken down the available colors. Here's our 16 colors we have to work with. Black, blue, green, cyan, blah, 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 blah. So as you're doing this, you can pick your favorite um, color. All right. So what does this code right here say to do? So we are moving to the beginning of our frame buffer, this 16-bit value. Okay, the first eight bits are a character. So what character is 41? I don't know what character is 41. Well, actually it's 41, 41 hex, which is uh, 65. That's a capital A. Yeah, so this is this is 41 hex. If I convert that to, I know where the second starts. We will be not yet. We haven't done anything yet. So 41 hex. So if I convert this guy to decimal, so that is one in the ones place plus six or uh, four in the 16s place so that's 64 so uh that is equal to 65 which maps to an uppercase a in hexadecimal make sense 97 would if we want lowercase. lowercase yep all right so this says the first uh eight bits are four and one, which maps to 65 in decimal, which is the ASCII character A. Then we're saying we want our, was it foreground color first? Foreground color to be a two, which is a green, and our background color to be an eight, which is a dark gray. So this will put an A with a green foreground color and a dark gray background color at Zero, zero, the upper left-hand corner of our frame buffer. Make sense? How this guy's working? All right. Uh, second cell corresponds to row zero. So we have um, our cells go down this way, and then we can write a cross on each one. So this is our base address plus 16 and that gets us to the next row zero. So column one, which would be um, the guy, not left-hand corner, but over one, would be our upper left-hand corner base address plus 16, which takes us to the top of column one plus another 16 top of, top of column two, plus another 16 top of column three, so on and so forth. And we have 80 of those columns. And each one of those is an array of 25, zero to 24. All right, so right in the frame buffer, can also be done in C, which is what we want, right? As much as we can. Okay, so we would need to give, so they're using a variable here called FB to give ourselves a, um, a base address for our frame buffer, and we'll see how that's accomplished here in a second. Go ahead. All right, I'm probably an idiot here. Um, so based on what you're saying, it iterates through the rows and then through the columns? Yes. Okay, unlike how we normally read. Actually, hold on, let me, I want to make sure I answer that correctly. Um, It iterates through the columns. Hmm. 
when we take steps across the top, those are going to be the columns. Okay, so it's going to you know, be column zero, column one, column two. Then we want to write down farther in there. It's going to be an address that is plus 80 times 16 to wrap around to the next row. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's, there's 80 columns. So, so as I'm adding 16, I'm still at, I'm at row zero, column zero, row zero, column one, row zero, column two. Once I get to 80 times 16 added to it, then it wraps back around and now I'm at row one, column zero. Oh, okay, sorry. I yeah, so it's one gigantic thing of memory. For some reason, I was thinking 16 was the um, row length, not the character length. <clears throat> well, it's not the character length, it's the character plus foreground color plus background color length. Right. Yeah, the bucket length, yeah. Wouldn't it make more sense to just stay in the column and, like, uh, iterate downwards? Uh, we could say that would make sense, but memory is linear. Ah, that's true. Remember, everything lives in one big, long street. Right. So, so row two is a little bit farther down that street. How many, how many, how much farther? 80 16-bit steps down, <laughs> farther right. down there is where my row two starts. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, and since I have 25 of them, I'm going to need... 80 times 16 times 25. So 80 times 16 times 25. So that's 32,000 bits of data. So divided by 1,024 is 31.25K of um, data. Divided by eight is four bytes. I'm sorry, four kilobytes of data for my frame buffer a little bit under but that's the size of our frame buffer is about third is about four kilobytes of data make sense but it's all one big long line um okay so here notice in c we can create a char pointer that so char pointer, they're just naming it FB for frame buffer, and they're setting that equal to the base address of our frame buffer. That is a known address, a hard-coded address. We're not asking the operating system to give us new memory, to allocate memory or anything. We're saying, I know exactly where I'm putting this dude. Right there, because it is a magical value where the frame buffer lives. Make sense? That is what we were talking about here with our memory mapped I.O. Okay, so we can create a <clears throat> variable in C and give it a hard-coded address. Then we can say, I'm going to put the first byte, because in C, chars are eight or one byte, eight-bit values. So I'll say my uh, bucket zero, which is the first byte in the frame buffer, should be an uppercase A, which will get mapped to the value of A in decimal, which ultimately will get stored in hexadecimal. But we like writing an A, so this is human consumption. Make sense? Human beings are going to write, here's where my frame buffer is. It's an array of chars, array of chars in... Uh, C are bytes, byte size, uh, whereas in uh, Java, they are 16-bit, two bytes for Unicode, but C is ASCII. So here's saying, here's my array called FB. It starts at, it just happens to start at the place where the frame buffer starts, and I'll put in the first byte, the ASCII character I want to store, which just happens to match up with what it's asked us to put the first byte being the ASCII character. Then in the next nibble, the next four bits, a nibble is a half a byte. It's what it's, it's, a half a byte is called a nibble. That's a true thing, yeah. Get it? You take a byte, take a nibble. Is it spelled differently? N-I-B-B-L-E, same. Just to clarify, 
the FD that they're using, is that just for their representation or is that actual? No. No, they defined it right here. This is, it's just, uh, they could have called that elephant. Well, like, uh, I mean, is that actual? <laughs> That's a, that is C code, and they happen to name theirs FB, but you could call yours Elephant if you want. I don't talk about the name. I mean, like, the FB01A, whatever, that, is that actually what it is, or is that just they're doing that as an example to represent what's going on? Well, they're mimicking what we did up here. This is loading into bucket 00 of the frame buffer, and A, that is green on a dark gray background. Green is the two. Eight is the dark gray. That makes sense? Yeah, this is the C equivalent of passing it all these bits. So there's my capital A. There is, well, I'm sorry. Let me show you when their example here. There's my capital A, and there's my next nibble, and there's my last nibble. That's why they're loading a 28 into that second one. Make sense? N I B B L E nibble. I'm guessing you looked up uh, a similarly spelled word. You have a strange uh, Google result. <laughs> Wait, what did you search? Well, she didn't hear B. Oh. Oh, because I've been hearing that word. I'm like, this is so simple. <laughs> She got the Freddy the Falcon, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, V. <laughs> All right, so this makes sense. This is the C version of what we did bitwise above. Go ahead. Um, could we use a bit field so we don't have to translate everything into hex and just put the individual? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, can, we can do a lookup. Okay. I mean, you can do whatever you want. It's, you're writing it in C. If you want to give yourself mappings for it, you can have it map the dark gray to the special number if you want. All right, so here's how we can wrap this into a function. So here's an example of, uh, and this is where we're going to start seeing some bit shift stuff. All right, so we're going to have a frame buffer write function. So this writes a cell in the frame buffer. This is a convenience for us, right? This is something we would write. We'll end up putting it into our code here in a bit, okay? But we're gonna say, look, I can sit here and mess around with all my, my ASCII values and the, you know, the right for, you know, the right nibble size things for uh, background color, foreground color. I can make that all work, but it's gonna drive me crazy pretty quick, right? So what we can do here is we can say, let's write a C function that we'll just happen to name FB underscore write underscore cell because we are writing to a cell in the frame buffer. And this guy's gonna take in several parameters. It's gonna take in the location in the frame buffer, so which cell. So the first 80 of those cells are in row zero, the next 80 are in row one, the next 80 are in row two, okay? So the index of my cell. Then what character am I gonna write? What's its foreground color? What's its background color? Now notice it's representing these as a char. Why is it representing it as a char? Is that your question? Oh, no. What's your question, go ahead. I was gonna say, correct me if I'm wrong, but- You're wrong. Uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> correct me. <laughs> saying um, unsigned uh, char FD is just uh, a way of saying like, that's gonna be user input. Um, no, you're definitely wrong. Okay. Yeah, unsigned means it can't hold negative numbers. Oh. So this gives you the full eight bits. This is zero to 255. Okay. So a char is size eight bits. Uh, char is size eight bits. Unsigned says we're gonna use the full eight bits for magnitude. We're not gonna be able to store negative values. So we have eight bits, which is gonna be zero to 255 or 256 unique values, which is actually kind of funny. It's related to the question I was asked is, if my foreground color is stored as a nibble, my background color is stored as a nibble. Why am I passing in unsigned chars? Hmm? Uh, well, an unsigned char is eight bits. So I need four bits for this guy, yet I'm giving it eight bits. Why is that? Go ahead. It's because we're, in the function, we're gonna be using 
it was up for four, four, so it'll just combine together. Um, well, yes, you, we will end up combining them together, but I'm passing in a value cannot exceed four bits. Yet I've said we're going to put it into something capable of holding eight bits. That's what he just said. That's how we're going to combine it. Yeah. But why aren't I taking it in as four bits instead of, why am I taking it in as eight bits instead of four bits? But well, we don't have a four bit. Printer. That's it. We, we are choosing to use C. Oh, okay. We are choosing to use the C language. We're stuck with whatever C is going to give us. And the smallest data type in C is a byte, okay. which is a. But aren't chars normally unsigned? Uh, chars would be normally unsigned. Uh, in modern languages, a char is a byte type. We don't have the byte primitive type in C. So a byte is stored in an unsigned char. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a byte would be stored in a char. A char would be stored in an unsigned char. So I get the full zero to 255 instead of negative 128 to positive 127. I just don't think I've ever seen a char in C have a negative value, so. You wouldn't if it was actually holding chars. Right. But keep in mind that the char data type, the char primitive type, is a fancy name. It happens to be spelled char, so it leads us to believe it's there's a character in there. But all it is is an 8-bit data type. So an unsigned char can hold 0 to 255. A signed char can hold negative 128 to positive 127. So if you were going to do math with it and you needed to hold negative numbers, you'd want it to be a signed char, okay. which is the default for char. Okay. Uh, which works out okay because ASCII is actually only 100 and, uh, 0 to 127. <clears throat> yeah, ASCII is a, yeah, it's a 0, uh, it's a 7-bit value, not an 8-bit value. Oh well, yeah, because you have another 128 bits to work with. Exactly. Might as well put crap in there. Right. Well, 128 unique values to work with, so you can start putting your smiley faces and cards and all that stuff. Okay. All right. So in any case, here's a C function that's hopefully going to write something. You know, our intention is we're going to write to bucket that in our frame buffer. This value with this foreground color and this background color. Make sense? So right here, we're going to store at bucket I. That is the position, the first eight bits of our, um, uh, this bucket of our uh, frame buffer is going to store our C, the character we want to store. That's what goes in the first eight bits. Make sense? The second eight bits is where we have our foreground and background color. And this is where we need to um, put these guys together. So we're going to say, OK, I need to go to bucket I plus 1. This will be the next byte over from the first byte where the letter exists. So I'm going to go to the next byte over. I'm going to store there my foreground color bitwise ended with 0. Well, bitwise data was 0 F. So that means that the first four uh, bits are 0. The second four bits are 1. 1, 1, 1, 1 is an F. So this is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. We're bitwise anding that with my foreground color. And then we're left shifting it by 4. So that will guarantee that my foreground color, the 4-bit value, we are trusting that you're going to send it a legal foreground color, one of our 4-bit values. All right? So we're going to say, I'm going to take my foreground color as a 8-bit number, because that's what it was, even though it, I know it has to fit in 4-bits. Okay? So you better have given me a good value. Okay? So I, but I have 8-bits I'm working with here. I'm trusting the value you gave me only takes up half of that. I'm going to go ahead and take that whole thing 
and end it by 0f, okay, which will keep our original values and zero out all the other ones. So I'll have in that bit space, I'll have 0, 0, 0, 0, followed by my nibble. Then I'll left shift at 4, having only the 4-bit version of my foreground color in the left four bits of my 8-bit space. Then I'm going to OR that with my background color ended with this. Notice I'm not shifting that guy. All right, so let's see what let's see how that works out. All right. So we're going to take our example here, which was what, 2 and 8? Is that our example? Yeah, 2 and 8. All right, so we're passing, yeah, so we're passing 2 in <laughs> for our foreground, and we're passing 8 in for our background. All right, and now we have an 8-bit representation of that foreground. So that is going to be a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. That is the number 2 in 8 bits. Make sense? And we are ending that. Let's go back to our code here. What are we doing with that? We are taking that foreground color and we're ending it with 0F. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 1, 1, 1. All right, we're ending it with that guy. Make sure we're doing the right thing here. Foreground and with that. Okay. And that's going to give us a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. All right, then we're left shifting it 4. which is going to give us that value. Now, hold on. Just look at this. So if you see this 4-bit value, the left 4 bits, if you only look at those left 4 bits, what decimal value is that? That's a 2. Right? So we took the 8-bit version of a 2 and turned it into a 4-bit version of a 2, giving ourselves a bit space of four to put our background color, which is what comes next. Go ahead. So why do we have to end um, at the two? It's called masking. That's how we're guaranteed to get our, uh, by ending it, we are modifying our right four bits so that when we shift, it'll be the original value in four bits instead of eight. So we're masking the original value. The math works out to do it this way. understand from a practice well more practically like what benefit it has at least in this case there's no other values but is this like if there's maybe some loose ones oh, oh you're asking why did we do this in the first place yeah we could have just um it yeah i get what you're saying this guarantees that your values from uh here flow through uh whatever they are i'm trying to think if i can give you a good example of why they're masking it with that because it's a good question No, no, no. I, I get what you're asking. Because in this case, had we not done that, it wouldn't have been a problem. Let's do the other part of it, and then let's see if we bump into the reason why. Okay. So then we're going to take our background color. Okay, so this is our, call that our new foreground. So now our background color is going to be, um, let's see, what's that, one... So that's an eight. All right, so that's eight. And we are going to end that with that, giving us a all right, 
and that's going to be our new background. And then we're oaring those guys together. So I'll take this guy here. This is a bitwise or, so that's going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So that is the mask of our foreground slash background. Foreground value, background value. Um, I'm thinking the anding it is to protect us from you passing in values that are larger than um, four bits. Okay. So it's making sure you don't write a value that's not allowable because if we did pass in a 30, mm -hmm. which is bigger than we could pass in, we have to pass in zero to 15. That would be uh, values on the left-hand side of the four bits. Mm -hmm. So ending it by that will guarantee us to have, um, actually, yeah, it will guarantee us to have zeros on the left. So let me, if we just use an example real quick. So a, if I had like one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, something like that. This is, and that was passed in as our foreground value. Yeah. This is an illegal foreground value. Mm -hmm. If we ended that with zero ones, we're preserving these four bits, guaranteeing they're what they were before. We're only using those four, those four bits, but we're getting zeros out of this. Um, the real question there though is, is it's probably not that important on the first part because we're shifting it left anyway. So we're losing those bits, so, but it would be important in the other one when we or them yeah. together that you don't have. Um, so I guess we could just say it cleans the bits, cleans the bit space. Okay. Go ahead. What were you going to ask? Uh, it was with the shifting. If we actually just chopped off the values there, then they get pushed over them. Yeah. Okay. I, so I would say it's necessary for the background doesn't seem to be necessary for the foreground, but we can just say that that move is cleaning the bit space, guaranteeing you're only using four bits of it. Whether you pass too big of a value in or not, you're only gonna be using four bits of it. All right, so this is our updated value there. That makes sense? So bucket I is gonna get our character, bucket I plus one, which is our second byte, we'll get our merged foreground background in four bit chunks, nibble size chunks, or whatever V searching for, size chunks. <laughs> nibble, ba, ba. B is in boy, nibble, like a boy. I think she looked up as it was oh, P is oh, in pony. There's actually some probably some pretty. If you think back to some of the geeks that made some of these things in the early days, we're probably lucky that some of the names aren't worse than they are. <laughs> is what it is. All right, so this was a C function that effectively allows us to write to the frame buffer in a much more C-like fashion. That makes sense? Without us having to do the, the crazy bit stuff. All right, so then here's an example how we can use uh, that guy. So this says we're going to write to cell zero an A that is green for the foreground and dark gray for the background, presuming you've defined these constants for green and dark gray. So you can create constants that map out this entire chart here. So you can pass things in by their, um, called a macro, by their macro name as opposed to uh, the, the value. Make some sense? Okay, um, yeah, so we'll just leave it at that for now. Now, moving the cursor. So, um, moving the cursor in the frame buffer is done via two different I.O. ports. The cursor's position is determined with a 16-bit integer. Zero means row zero. 
column zero is one. Um, well, let's see, column zero means row zero, column zero. One means row zero, column one, just like we explained. So the first 80 are your row zero, the next 80 are your row one, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, 80 means row one, column zero, and so on. Since the position is 16 bits large and the out assembly code instruction argument is eight bits, the position must be sent in two different turns to make your jumps. If you're, that's if you're just moving the cursor for your next, your next right, because you only have your input for out. If we go back to our thing for out here, it takes two parameters, the address of the IO port and the data to send. And it's gonna be sent as a, uh, well, the address is going to be sent as a um, unsigned char which only is eight bits, one byte. And we actually need to take 16 bit jumps because we have to take it, the ASCII value plus foreground plus background to make our jumps through memory. All right, so we need 16 bit jumps. All right, so to so set the cursor at row one, column zero. So this would be um, position 80, zero to 79 being row zero. 80 to 159 being row one, so on and so forth. So we'd have the following assembly code instructions. So we would write out. So 14 tells the frame buffer to expect the highest eight bits of the position. So this would be our first eight bits. Then uh, 3D5, that's the next eight bits. So this is making the jump across the two 16 bits, so we're calling it twice. 15 tells the frame buffer to expect a lower eight bits. So we are passing our first value of 14. The second value is of out. Takes two parameters, the IO port and the data we're gonna send. So this guy's gonna say, send no data. So send the value, the address with no data, which says don't send it yet followed by the lowest eight bits, the second bump to get our full 16 bit address, the size of our steps. So we're stepping eight bits for the ASCII value, another eight bits for the foreground and background, but we have to call out twice since this is a byte, not a 16, not, a, not two bytes. We need 16 bits to send. So we're gonna send our first eight bits followed by zero data, because out takes two parameters. Notice this is 3D4, 3D5. This is parameter zero, parameter one. Then we're sending parameter zero again, parameter one. So this is our first address, send no data. Second address, the second half of our actual address, actually send the data. Um, so this sends the lowest bits of 0, 05, uh, which is, well, it'll be 0, 0, 5, 0, so this is 50 in hex. So convert that. That's the data we're actually sending out. Um, okay, so the assembly code instruction, so out is something that we cannot write in C. So this is where we would embed that inside of our program. So this is our C program. And we would create a global directive here called out B, call it whatever you want, but we're gonna call it out B. And this guy is, and this will explain what's actually happening up above here. So out B is gonna have these four assembly instructions. We're gonna move into AL. So we have a hardware register called AX in our um, I386 CPUs. And AX is a 16-bit register, and it's divided into a high and a low bit space. So AL is the second eight bits. Okay. So AX is two eight-bit, or we'll put it in the notes here. AX register has AH 
and AL. AH is the high eight bits. Here we'll say 16 bit register. AL is the low eight bits. That makes sense. So this is AH. That's AL. See how that worked? So it's our way of getting to half of a register conveniently. It's just a shortcut for which of your uh, bytes you're going to access. So AL is just going to be the base address of AX plus eight. AH is the base address of AX plus zero. So it's where that value starts. Because sometimes you only, only need to store a byte, not a 16-bit value. So you can actually store two bytes inside of a 16-bit register. But keep in mind that if you just read from that register, you're going to be reading the 16-bit value. You'll be reading your 8-bit value as a 16-bit value. And if you store two different numbers in there, that's going to be a pretty scary looking value. So if I have a value like 1101111 one, 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 Six, seven, something like that. And then I have zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, one, something like that. If I read this from AL and AH individually, I'll have this 8 bit number and this 8 bit number, which are reasonable. But if I read this whole 16 bit number, that's a giant number, right? So that's a number that's, you know, up there in the high, high thousands. 65,000, something or other, 58,000, whatever this ultimately comes out to. All right, so AHAL gives us partial access to a register. Yeah. So are all registers swept into a high and low like that? Not all. Okay. But the base registers are, there's I think four of them, AX, BX, CX, DX. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, that <laughs> might, okay. um, <laughs> it's possible there's more that have high and low, but okay. at the very least they do. All right, so we're going to move into the low part of the AX register. The stack pointer, so ESP was our stack pointer, plus 8. So move the data to be sent into our um, uh, AL register. So this value right here, wherever our stack is, plus 8. Notice up here, so... Uh, this is the data byte that we're writing. Plus four is the I.O. port. And the base address of the ESP is the return address. Where is it coming back to? All right, because ultimately we want, remember we talked at the end of class last time about the stack? We want our final answer to be at the top of the stack. So that's why our return address will be the stack itself the base address of the stack. IO port will be four bytes in from that. So our stack is gonna be 32 bit chunks, which makes sense. You know, you have, we're working with eight, 16, 32 bit values maybe. So you figure, well, we'll have each area of our stack capable of holding 32. We don't have to put 32 bits there, but we're presuming we are, so don't try to efficiently use portions of the stack. You want to be able to take 32-bit jumps through your stack. So this is saying we will, from the base address of ESP, one bucket into our stack is where we'll have our IO port. And then two buckets into our stack is where we'll have the data that we're going to write. That's why it's plus four and plus eight. Four bytes, 32 bits, plus eight, 64 bits, which is two 32-bit hops off the base address. So what is out B going to be? This is us embedding assembly code into C. So we'll move into AL, whatever is currently at our second bucket of our stack. Second from the top. We'll move into DX, whatever is 
at our first bucket of our stack. We'll move, well then, here's a assembly instruction called out. We referenced it here. Out takes two parameters, the address of the IO port and the data to send. Address of the IO port, data to send. Following it? Yeah. All right. So we loaded in AL and AX, our two parameters. Then we called the out instruction, passing it where it can find those two parameters. Send the data and the IO port. And then we tell this assembly, embedded assembly instruction uh, to return. And the return address will be at the top of the stack. Go ahead. So I think I'm following so far, but um, why are we using uh, EX instead of AX? Well, AX would overwrite part of AL. Oh, okay. Oh, I suppose. Yeah, AL is a portion of, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Is there a reason why we're specifically using A and D instead of like B and C? Uh, probably naming conventions. I mean, typically your uh, D register is your data register. Okay. Um, uh, it doesn't look like this guy specifically is requiring us to use DX since we're passing that as a parameter to out. So it looks like it just requires us to use a 16-bit register. Okay. And an 8-bit register. Because this is sending 8 bits of data at a time. And then we're returning. So this is us embedding some assembly code into our C program so that we can still use C for, call it 90% of the job, but call upon some assembly code when necessary. You're gonna see how this is used here in a minute. All right, so we are having some code here so they're, they're Having a function in a foot, this file is called io.s. We'll kind of go back and copy stuff in. I just want to make sure based on time I get through uh, the material. All right, so this is a file called io.h. So we'll have our um, Command port and data port. So that's the 3D4, 3D5 that we saw up above. This guy right here, 3D4, 3D5. So these are serial ports, uh, data ports that we're writing out to. So we're hard coding the addresses of these up here. These are called macros. So we're defining the frame buffer command port to be this and the frame buffer data port to be this. Then we're defining, so these are the IO port commands, frame buffer high byte to be 14, frame buffer low byte to be 15. Again, that is the C code equivalent of this right here. But what we weren't able to do in C code, and we're gonna see in a second, is we couldn't write the out function. We still had to embed that as assembly code inside of our C program. All right, so here's our out B function, which we named right here. Out B function is taking an unsigned short, that is a 16-bit value, <laughs> an unsigned <laughs> short port. All right, so that's a 16-bit value and an unsigned char data, which is an 8-bit value. There's our 8-bit value. There's our 16-bit value. This has to do, I think we talked about it last time with how parameters work in assembly. It goes from right to left. So the first parameter gets pushed onto the stack. Then the next one gets, well, the far right parameter gets pushed onto the stack first. Then the next parameter to its left gets pushed onto the stack second. Right, so they pop off in the right direction. <laughs> okay, so we're moving into our 16-bit register here, the far left parameter that was passed in. We're moving into our 8-bit register here, the far 
in our case, we have two parameters. The far right parameter that was passed in. So it's first in, last out? First well, in, first it's, out. this will be pushed onto the stack first. Right, first this will be pushed on top of that. So it goes from right to left for your parameters. Right. So that. when you start using it inside your code, you're going to say, okay, well, this guy is expecting two inputs. I will find the first input two buckets down on my stack because I pushed it and then I pushed something else on top of it. Yeah. So the first guy is at four down off the top of the stack. Yeah. And then the next guy is cause 32 bits, right? We have 32 bits of data, even though we know that we only loaded 16 in there. Okay. And then the next one, we know we only loaded eight in there, but we still have a 32 bit bucket. That's why we're jumping by four bytes. So this guy gets pushed onto the stack and then this guy gets pushed on top of him. Right. So when we go and use those values, we will get the second guy down on the stack, which is our 8-bit value, put it in AL. Then the first guy on the stack, which is our 16-bit value, into DX. Then we'll use the out command that's built into assembly that we can't write in C. We're relying on using the assembly version of this. So then we'll call out on those two values to write out to a specific port, whatever port is stored inside of DX. What value? The value stored in the 8-bit lower part of the register AL. Lower part of AX called AL. Fun? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, that's how stack works, but I mean, I don't try to define it like that. Just the way parameters for functions that go from C to assembly get loaded onto the stack is from right left. to left. Okay. Go ahead. So, the parameters are passing in, in our C function, <laughs> gets thrown onto the stack, and that's how we can just grab them magically inside of the assembly. Correct. Stack. Okay. Correct. That's what, when, C, when you go through a C compiler, that's what the C compiler will do with the parameters coming into a function. It will push them onto the stack in right to left order. That's why we can trust that if we know that my out B function is taking in two parameters, I know that the first parameter will be there and my second parameter will be there. And I know my output will become the new top of the stack, which is ESP. So ESP stands for stack pointer. Mm -hmm. So the assembly is written in C, but we're writing assembly? Or, or this well, is we're inside the C file. This would be stored inside of something dot C. Actually, this is probably in the dot H file. How will we write assembly in C? It's allowed. No. This, is, this is how we do it. We create a global, call it, in this case, we're calling it out B. We can call that whatever we want. That's going to be the name of our function. Then we, so this is called a wrapper, is what it's called. So I am taking this function header. This is what I want C to allow me to do. I want to be able to call something called out B and give it two parameters. So this is C syntax. This guy is wrapping the assembly code that, which is getting first parameter, second parameter, this guy returns a value. Actually, he doesn't actually return a value. Instead, he just magically puts a value back on the stack. So it's void. What does he do? He does the out thing, writes, something, writes this data out to this port. And then he returns having the result placed on the stack. All right, that makes sense? So this gives us control of assembly from within a C program and the punchline for this is as operating system developers, we want to control, we'd like to write as much of our stuff in C as possible. And every now and then we have to wade into assembly. So rather than having to create a whole other assembly file and, and go through the assembler and link it and all this stuff, we can just do it all inside of our C program because the compiler is capable of having C wrapped assembly functions. Huh? But I mean, you, you might go through a whole career of using C and never have to do this. I mean, it, no, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. 
like, the only reason we're doing this is so that we could still use C for a majority of this. So we're saying that you know this uh, this out and in these are like primitive type of operating system functions, right? Yeah. I mean, we would say that um, any computer will have the way to output to the screen and read something in from the user. That's yeah. like a minimum requirement of a computer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so those are such primitive functions that we don't have a way of accomplishing that at, at that low of level in C. But it's not that many lines of code, so we could just say, look, I want to give myself just a way of do, just doing that one little piece, but I want to kind of get to it through C. So this allows us to create this, you know, the, the four line little you know, kind of multi-punch type thing to accomplish an out instruction. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so then we say something similar. We can now move the cursor inside of a C function that looks like this. So keep in mind that this guy is a function called out B that we wrote. So this is our wrapped function whose logic is captured right there. That's the move of wrapping an assembly function inside of a C function. All right, so when we're done with this, when, when, when this thing has compiled, we now have a C function that looks like this. That did not actually go through the compiler because we said, you do exactly this. We gave it its assembly instructions and then exposed it to us as a C function called out B. So we wrapped this nice package of assembly inside of something that looks like a C function and said, just don't open this, just call it. <laughs> okay, when you need this, you call it. You give them two parameters, they'll take care of the rest. You'll be all right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no. I That's what's called wrapping. Okay. So from this point forward, you don't have to be scared of it. Okay, no, it's I'm already sure. written, and now you can just use it. We're going to see it being used in a second. Go ahead. Do you have a question? or no, that you're, you're up to... Up to where we are? I'm good now. Okay. So now you can see us using that. So if we want to move the cursor within the frame buffer, we might have a C function that takes in a position in there for moving the cursor, right? And then we're calling our wrapped C function, out B, that has a header that looks like this. Takes in the port. Where am I writing? And what am I writing? We don't have to peek again at the scary crap behind the scenes there. We have a nice C wrapper for that. So now inside here, I can call out B, passing it my command port for my frame buffer. So this is this guy right here, 3D4. Passing it my high byte command, which is the 14. Passing it the data port which is going to be my uh, position on, so this is pause, shifted by eight, anded with 00FF, 32-bit value. So that's why we're shifting it by eight because of where it's gonna be on the stack. And output again, so we're calling that same command again, passing it my low byte command with my position and it was 00FF. So this will give me, so this is gonna be a right, 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 right. We have to make, we're actually making two passes, but we're making two passes by writing uh, eight bits, two passes with four calls. Eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. So that's mimicking these four lines right here. Gotcha. All right, so that will move the cursor to a particular position on our frame buffer. All right, so now our actual driver. Because at the end of the day, what are we actually doing? We'd like to write a string 
of a certain length to the screen. All of this work and all we're able to do is put a single character with a single foreground color with a single background color to the screen. But in real life, when we think we'd like to write hello world to the screen, right? Which is this char pointer, which points to the H, the beginning of the string, and has a length of, what is it, 5, 10, 11? Is that a length? Hello world is 11? Okay, so I'm saying here's the base address of my string. This is how long it is. I think I'm counting right. Is 11? Hello world 11? Sure. All right. Yep, that's my length. So that it can walk through this, calling, moving my position in my cursor each time to do the H, then the E, then the L, then the L, then the O, then the space, then the W, so on and so forth. Whoever thought it would be this complicated? Well, consider now the power tools we have available to us as programmers. All this is happening under the hood even today. All right? I'm really glad I know that now, but it, like, take this for granted. But now look, look at this. So now our driver, it's going to provide an interface from this point forward for us to write crap to the screen. We only have to do this once, right? So this is for interacting with that frame buffer. Now, the idea is that we probably want to think about it like this. So the book is suggesting that you know, there's no right or wrong way of doing this, um, but a suggestion <laughs> is maybe have a write function that takes in a string and how long it is because arrays in C can't report their length. I think we should follow that suggestion. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense, right? You're writing a string to the screen. Here's my string. This is how long it is. We can actually kind of fake it the way strings are usually implemented because they have a string termination character backslash zero. So you could actually write it to search through there and not actually take in a length. Kind of a convenience thing if you wanted to, but. All right, so that's code that gets us to, you know, that, that's the idea of writing this driver, okay? But now we have to prepare our serial ports put them in the mode that they can, they can do their, their, their writing. How are we doing on time? We have time. Okay. Okay, put them into the mode for doing their writing. All right, so when we're configuring a serial port, they have to agree on a couple of things. Uh, was it in here that we talked about modems with the beeping and the agreeing on, on speeds? Thing? Was it, did I do that in here? Okay. Well, so when we have two different devices communicating with each other over a serial port, that serial port doesn't necessarily, is, is not necessarily governed by a uh, um, error checking or anything like that. It just says, hey, here's data. I'm going to send you data. You're going to receive that data. We probably should agree upon a cadence, a speed at which I'm going to send it that you're expecting to receive it. Right? Otherwise, you might be kind of receiving it and you're turning here and all of a sudden you get hit in the back of the head with a baseball. <laughs> right? You, get, you want to be on a similar... Get it? Yeah. Alright, so you're going to kind of pick a, uh, pick a screen. Uh, so we're going to have the speed, bit or baud rate. So if you look at old uh, modems, a lot of times they're like a 24 baud modem, bits per second modem, 9600 baud modem, so on and so forth. Any error checking that we should have in there? Parity, parity bits, stop bits. So parity bits are kind of like uh, how many ones should you find? Is it an even or odd number of ones? And then stop bits are kind of their way of like, you know, at the, at the end of sending, you maybe throw it one or two bits, kind of, you know, maybe you always end every transmission with a one one. You know, kind of like, are you ready? Are you ready for the next one? Ready for the next one? Ready for the next one? You know, like a little heads up type thing. So you can choose to do that. Um, and then how big are you sending down the pipe? Is it bite size, truck size, house size, <laughs> whatever it is? <laughs> how heavy are these packages you're shipping across the serial ports? So you got to agree upon a couple of these pieces of information so both, both parties can, can consistently and accurately send and receive data. So it's like a blind, blind baseball 
players in the sports. They, they know exactly where each other are, but they can't see each other. Correct. So, like, the shots thing at each other. Yep, I think that's pretty <laughs> accurate. <laughs> I'm going to throw this one at 60 miles per hour. I hope he's ready. <laughs> um, okay. So, let's see. So when we're configuring the line, so the first thing we might do is we might uh, pick the speed. So the default clock speed for a uh, serial port is 115,200 baud bits per second. All right, so you might decide we're gonna operate at half speed. So you have a divisor to get you the half speed of, of that guy. So divisor is a 16 bit value. Uh, we can only send eight bits at a time. We must therefore send an instruction the, telling the serial port to first expect the highest bits, then the lowest bits. Okay, so we're starting to see a pattern there. Whenever we need to send more data than it can accept at once, we do it in kind of two swings. Like here's the first eight bits, here's the second eight bits. Here's the high, here's the low. So you two separate calls, but you have to let it know where to put those because it's going to be loading them somewhere and you don't want it to overwrite the value you just sent. Right? You got 16 bits of space. You put eight bits here that you just received. The next eight bits go into the low space, for example. Um, so this is done by sending hex 80 to the line command port shown below. So we'll see how this works. So now serial ports are offset from each other. So every port has a base address. Well, we have a base address for our COM1 serial port inside of our computer. So this is the base address of the COM1 port, 3F8. All right. Now, these other ports are offsets from that. So we have our data port, which is going to be at base, whatever this guy is. Our first in first out command port is going to be two bytes forward so it's 16 bit jump forward they're 16 bit ports three four five so we have 16 bits from the data port we can send 16 bits of data eight bits fifo eight bits uh line command modem command status you'll see how these are used in a second all right, so we're just setting up English-like terms here for crazy looking memory addresses. This is no different than what we had above when we had like the different colors mapped at the top. They just mapped two, but we could have mapped more than two if we wanted to, all right? Um, well, I guess like, like kind of like the components of the packet. This is before TCP IP, so we're not dealing with packet based networks, but yeah, similar to that, here's the stuff. Uh, that we're going to send. All right. So again, we're using our out B function because we already have this function that allows us to write stuff out, right? So we're going to write something to a COM port and we're going to write. So remember we're, we're setting up our COM port here. So we're going to write something to the COM port and then we're going to write a divisor, which is we're negotiating speed right now. The assumed speed is full speed, the 115K baud. All right, and then we hit our divisor saying, this is how much you should slow down. So we can agree upon this. All right, so we're gonna have to do this in a couple of swings. So we'll set, we're gonna let our serial command port. So we're outputting to this location. What location is it? It's going to be this guy up here which takes a base address and that's gonna to translate to this base address. Uh, DLab, it's a linkable, this is an error checking thing. Yeah, so that's the value we're sending. I think it's just zero or one. Zero or one for uh, this value, whether you want to uh, allow it or not allow it. Um, then we're sending to data port. Our divisor shifted by eight. So it's a 32 bit value, but we're only giving it a four bit. Shifted by eight would be 32 bit value that we're gonna compress down to
Well, this would say we're compressing it to 16 bits. Uh, let, we'll come back and figure out what's why we're shifting by eight. It's compatible with this, but I don't know why divisor. Divisor is coming as a short. That's a 16-bit value. So we're taking that 16-bit value, sh uh, shifting it by eight bits. So we're cutting it in half in terms of its bit space. We're shifting it to the right which means that the value of it is going to be in the left 8 bits. So this moves the value to the lower 8 bits. Yeah, moves the value to the lower 8 bits, and this zeroes out the left 8 bits and maintains the right 8 bits. But again, this would go back to your question before, why are we zeroing out the left 8 bits if we're guaranteed that they're all zeros right here when we shifted that? Eight bits. Oh, it's well. If we're shifting at eight bits, and we had oh, something, we had a bunch of ones to the left. It would still be zeros over there since we're shifting it by eight. Yeah, I'm not sure why we're ending it. I think we're we kind of agreed before that maybe this is just the go-to move for cleaning the data, guaranteeing zeros. Yeah, but that's weird because you are guaranteed to have zeros in the left eight bits after that because this guy is a 16-bit value that's what a short is so you're guaranteed this is 16 bits if you're shifting by eight then your left eight bits are definitely zeros so ending it by that ending with f's guarantees you save what's currently there ending with zeros make sure you clean it out <laughs> but it should already be cleaned out so that part seems like it's doing nothing but Maybe it's just kind of like a hard-coded way of saying, clean it. All right. Um, then we'll write out to our uh, data port again. The divisor. So this is the other half of our divisor. So notice we're not shifting it this time. So this will get our left 8 bits. So this guy says our right 8 bits are filled, guaranteeing the left 8 bits are zeros. This guy is saying, now we'll take our other value and maintain our right 8 bits, keeping our left 8 bits where they were. Giving yourself the full 16 bits of value for the divisor. Um, or we could have sent the divisor in as duplicate. I guess that would be kind of weird. We could send the divisor in as two duplicate 8-bit values back to back that we wouldn't need to do shifts mm -hmm. but I guess it's better to let them pass in a numeric divisor and then us do the mapping inside than us have to send it in in like a very special format or something like that all right so this function here configures our baud rate tells the communication channel that we're going to operate at a certain speed, whatever that speed that we're going to agree upon is. All right, so this is showing us what that bit space looks like. So the way data should be sent must be configured. Uh, this is also done via the command, uh, the line command port. And this is what it has to look like. So we have eight bits of data. So D, this uh, is our D lab. So this is uh, an error checking thing. I think the L stands for like latch. Data latch allowed byte. Divisor latch, uh, latch access bit. Mm. I'll give you a better explanation of this, but for now, I think they probably are going to send. Uh, we'll see what the example they give here is, but. It's a zero or one. 
whether it's enabled or disabled. Uh, brake control, this is for um, like error messaging, so uh, brake at the end of the line. Uh, if you want to enable that or disable it, and we'll see examples of how that works if something doesn't fill up the whole line. Um, parity, this is for this is error checking. Usually it's an even or odd number of ones or zeros. Um, number of stop bits to use, we talked about that. That's you know like us kind of deciding on one, two, three bits at the end of uh, every communication that we're going to set aside. So that's less data we're allowed to send. But those last one, two, three bits are us saying, are you ready for the next one? All right, so that's our stop bits. Uh, and then how long the data is. All right, so they're saying they're going to use a standard value of three. So meaning we have a length of eight bits, no parity bit. So remember, this is going to be a eight bit representation of the number uh, uh, three. So that's this guy right here. All right, so this is giving us a um, length of eight bits that we're sending, no parity bit, one stop bit, break control disabled, that's what the zeros are coming from. So this is D is zero, B is zero, no parity bits, no stop bits, and data length is, um, so DL is the length of our data. So this is a uh, four bytes or four bits, four bits, so eight bits total. So that's what this zero three represents. A, a lot of times these are called mask values. So it's a eight bit value that when they look at the individual bits, you know, I'm gonna look at this bit, this bit, and this pair of bits down here, those types of things. It tells it what kinds of stuff it's, we're setting that port up to do. All right, so this is us configuring the port to do communication the way we want it to uh, work. Similarly, configuring the buffers. Notice we're still using the exact same function for doing these things. We used our out B function that we wrote above to do this. Um, and we're talking to this command port, serial line command port to set up the standards for that guy before we start sending and receiving things. So we wrote this special out B function once, which uses the uh, assembly instruction for out. And then we call it over and over and over again, sending it effectively crazy looking hexamal, hexadecimal values that just follow this proprietary mapping of bits, right? Where the first bit means something, the next bit means something, the next three bits mean something else, the next one bit means something else, the last two bits mean something, right? Those are the rules provided for us into how they're gonna look at those bits on those serial ports to agree on stuff. All right. Configuring buffers, pretty similar. Again, another 8-bit value we're sending over there to kind of put it into the right mode. So the first two bits, well, the left two bits, are how many bytes should be stored in the first in, first out buffers. Next is if the buffer should be 16 or 64 bytes. So that's going to be just an on or off. Um, this guy is, a lot of times we'll see this inside of buffer use. They won't have a good use for one of the bits because it, they just don't need it for whatever the information they need to, the, they need to uh, work with. So they'll say it's reserved for future, but realistically it's, I didn't need it, so I didn't use it. But the documentation will usually say reserved for the future in case they decide at some point they want to use it, but it's not changing. Uh, D, how the serial port should be accessed. So DMA is for uh, direct memory access. It's for sending large files more quickly. Um, so usually we would probably disable that unless we had a really good reason to do it because now we're starting to fight with possible error checking stuff. Um, next one, clear the trans transmission FIFO buffer. So this will be on or off. Um, probably we would say on to clear it initially clear the receiver, receiver FIFO buffer, and then if the FIFO buffer should be enabled or not. So um, if this guy is disabled, then these guys would likely be disabled as well. All right, so they use the value C7, which says enable the FIFO buffer, 
clear both the send and receive. Uh, don't use DMA. Um, so there's those three. Here's DMA, here's the reserved, and then our um, buffer should be 16 or uh, 64. So I'm guessing zero means 16. So DMA, ignore this bit, use 16. One would mean 64, zero means 16. And then the first two is how many bytes should be stored in the FIFO buffer. Um, so 14 bytes uh, as size of Q. How does one one translate to 14 bytes? I don't know why that's 14 bytes. How many bytes should be stored in the FIFO buffer? Yeah, I don't know why this is 14. I'll look into that, but they're using this value, which is the maximum value you can have in there. So it's the buffer is as big as it can be. So there must be something with the way the buffers work that have a maximum size of 14 because there's some sort of over overhead for some of the, the data or something like that. Um, but in any case, we're writing C7, which is seemingly a random type value to it, but that C7 means that stuff, which translates into eight bits that means this stuff. So it's just a coded message. Right, as opposed to some weird mathy thing. Uh, same thing, configuring the modem. So, auto flow, reserved, loopback mode, um, receiving interrupts, whether it's ready to transmit, and data terminal. Uh, these are the two important ones here. So that's going to tell the port whether how it's going to kind of negotiate when it's going to send and receive stuff over serial ports. And I'll put something up on Slack for you to um, look through uh, dealing with programming serial ports. Um, a lot of these things, we always write the same stuff to it. This is what we tell the serial port to do when we want to write to it, but we have some flexibility. Um, this ready to transmit and data terminal ready those are the kind of the two things that are used for the two sides to decide when am I ready to receive data and ready my, when am I ready to send data. So those two are used pretty heavily. And uh, yeah, we see here they send 0, 3, and those are the only two they even use. All right, so they care about those things here and they just ignore all this stuff. So when we go to actually write data to the serial port, just like we had to uh, wrap our output function, our out function, we have to do the same thing with our in function. So in says we're going to, if we go back here, in takes a single parameter, that's the address of the IO port and returns the data from the hardware. So when we read something in, all we're interested in is where am I reading this from? That's the one parameter in takes. Okay, so we only have one thing on the stack. Remember previously with our out, we had plus eight, we had plus four, because we had two parameters coming into our function. This one, we only have one parameter coming in. This is the address of the IO port that we're going to be reading from. We'll move that into DX. Then we call our in command and we're gonna read the byte from the IO port and store it in AL register. Remember, we're reading in a byte. AL is the low byte of the AX 16-bit register. So we're reading into the lower half of AX, whatever byte we're reading in from the COM port whose address is stored inside of DX. Make sense? So this is a built-in assembly function. That's, 
that line right there is the whole reason why we're having to wrap the assembler in our code because we can't write that ourselves in C. Then it becomes kind of a chicken or the egg problem. How do you write input and output in C if it relies on the input and output assembly instructions of your architecture? Can't do it. So this is us wrapping it and saying, I want to read some stuff from this guy. So it's saying, fine, you can read some stuff from that guy. We will use our architectures in command to read from this guy, loading the value into that guy. And then we're saying we're done. The return byte can be found inside of AL. Make sense? All right. And then we're going to find here a C wrapper for this, which is going to take one parameter. So here's our NB. Takes an unsigned short port number, so a 16-bit address for our port that we're reading in from. And it's ultimately going to return the byte the char that it read in. So this is our wrapped C function that we can then use, well, it wraps this crazy stuff that we only want to write once. And now we can call our C function here to read in from port over and over again. All right, so checks whether the transmit FIFO queue is empty or not for the given COM port. So we're going to, this tries to read from it. So serial is transmit FIFO empty. We're going to tell it where we're going to read from and we're going to return whatever NB returns for serial line status port on whatever we passed in, the address of that. Anded with two O's. So this is going to be the up the, the so this would be zero zero one zero 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 zero. Wonder why it's that. You're checking for that one bit. Oh, whether it's ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call. So it's looking for the ready to transmit bit. So it's it's peeling out just that one bit to say, is this guy ready for me to read from it? <laughs> Okay, so to do this in box, we have to edit our resource file a little bit to tell it about COM1, whether or not it's enabled, what kind of thing it is, and where the device output file is for logging. Um, so this allows us, and it, it's possible depending on how you created your box RC file, that you already have this line in there. So if I come over here real quick. I should be able to open 450. There's my box resource file. Uh, and I do not have anything in there for my. Uh, so there's my COM port information I put in there for COM1 enabled, blah, blah. So I just added it to the end. All right, and they told us to implement our write function in a similar way that we wrote our serial port thing last time. Well, our serial port thing up here for our read and our write. And they gave us an example of what they, remember I said, if they suggest we write it. Yeah. And then there's write a string with a length. All right, so your goal for next Monday is to have your operating system able to write 
Let's start with a single character to the screen, maybe at zero, zero. That'll be the easier version of doing it. All right. Um, and then we'll, well, I, I, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through a hello world in class next time. Um, so I challenge you to write something that takes in the entire string and writes a length. Um, but because we covered a lot of crap today, right? Yeah, if you can just write to zero, zero, just that very first bucket, get something on the screen, I think that puts us in a pretty good launching position. Okay. Sound fair? I get it now, but the real question is, can I retain all that? Well, this is all in the book. Everything we just went through. So go back through and listen to the explanation as we went through it. And a lot of it's going to be just copying and paste. So we want to understand what's actually happening. But keep in mind the power of what we just did is in and out those two things and having us have wrappers now allows us to use the frame buffer to write out whenever we want and to read in from any serial port over and over again just because we wrapped those two little chunks of assembly code okay so that's the power of c when we sometimes augment it with assembly all right so our goal is to if you want to just mimic what they uh did in their first thing is maybe to put an uppercase a with a, what was it, a green foreground and a dark gray background, I think it was. Yeah. Get that in the upper left-hand corner of your frame buffer. Right. Something like that, okay? But we'll go through a hello world or write whatever you want thing uh, next time, all right? I will see everybody next Monday. And I'm seeing Wednesday morning. We're gonna, yeah. we'll, we'll firm up. Are you, are you going or not going? I'm not going. Not going, okay. You but you're going. Yes, yeah, you said 7.15. Yeah. We'll firm up. All right. I will see everybody um, next Monday. And Bobby's coming Wednesday yes. to work on the server more. All right. Talk to you later. Oh, man. We almost burned through the whole battery. What the heck is that?